I'm so grateful to be in a conversation with you all and grateful for Daphne for creating this space where we can collaborate and co collectively rise to the challenge of addressing a pretty big crisis. So um, I'm particularly looking forward to the questions um, and the breakout groups where we can take this conversation further. Um, so the first time I realized the power of organized social movements was when I was at university in 2012. When deciding where I wanted to study for university, I knew that I wanted to go to a kind of progressive environmental school. Um, uh, and I found a liberal arts college in Vermont that had this stellar reputation for, you know, the first ever environmental studies program and lead platinum buildings. So, so excited um, and quickly found out that the university was investing its endowment in the world's dirtiest uh, and most destructive coal, oil and natural, natural gas companies. Um, so I was obviously devastated, um, but I wasn't alone in that anger and that anger collectively turned into action and students came together and we started a divestment campaign and we successfully pressured the university to divest. Uh, but it didn't stop there. Thousands of students across the country and even the globe mobilized and campaigned over the last 10 years on campuses and over 1300 institutions possessing some $15 trillion, which is so much money I can't even comprehend. Um, have divested from the fossil fuel industry and reinvested in the green economy. Environmentalist and Bill McKibben said, if a, uh, if a student's college endowment is invested in fossil fuel stock, then their educations are being subsidized by investments that guarantee that they won't have much of a planet on which to use their degree. And that exact message that he says is what the youth climate, climate strikers of today who feel the deep urgency and the burden of the climate crisis while being frustrated by government's complete inaction. So as we saw on the Mentimeter, many of you are very aware about the state of the climate emergency. And with COP coming up in the next few days, uh, we're seeing the significance of this moment. And you probably all know the science, but we know that if the planet warms beyond 1.5 degrees, things are gonna become catastrophic beyond imagination. Um, whilst we're seeing more and more attention to climate and we're seeing progress in some ways, the current climate policies that are now in place around the world are projected to result in three degrees of warming, breaking planetary boundaries and the planet that we all call home will be uninhabitable and costing billions of lives. So uh, that's very scary and um, that's very bad because we have nine years um, to radically transform our societies. Uh, the good news is we do actually know the solutions and um, we know how to effectively address this crisis, but we're running out of time to take meaningful action. So we truly need all hands on deck, and that does include the role of philanthropy. Given the urgency of this crisis, it's incredibly distressing to learn that less than 2% of, of global philanthropy is dedicated to addressing climate change. Within Europe, it's even less. So after leaving university, it was clear that you know business as usual wasn't compatible with a living planet. And so I spoke with my family, I tried to organize them to set up a philanthropic foundation to redistribute wealth. Um, we're a small foundation and we wanted to make sure our grant making was effective. Um, and we had many discussions and we considered multiple different approaches and issue areas that we were passionate about. We were passionate about gender justice and animal welfare and human rights. But we realized that climate change is the greatest threat to gender justice, animal welfare and human rights in the 21st century. It is this overarching monster and it touches, everything it touches, it exacerbates everything we care passionately about. So as a small funder, we weren't really sure how we could ever make a dent in this giant monster. Um, but we also knew we don't have time to wait and we just needed to start somewhere. So we looked at where climate philanthropy is going. And of that 2% of climate philanthropy, almost none of it is going to climate justice and social movements. And what do I mean by climate justice? Because I know this is a word that's getting thrown ar around a lot, um, but it's important for philanthropy to really understand what climate justice is. It's a concept of understanding how the causes and effects of climate change relate to concepts of justice, such as equality, historical responsibility, and reparative justice. It highlights the adverse impacts of climate change on poor people and countries in the global South. For example, wealthier countries have a greater responsibility for tackling climate change, as they've been the primary beneficiaries of carbon emissions for the last two centuries. So through this climate justice lens at our foundation, we understood and now believe that the current social, economic and ecological crises of our time call for an unwavering commitment 
to grassroots social movements to advance these transformative solutions and that this is where philanthropy has a crucial, crucial role to play. We believe that building power from below is the best hope to tackle the climate crisis. Um, at Solberga, we support activists and social movements that are essential to transforming the landscape of power and political will. Individual actions are great, and corporate actions, but they're just not enough to stop the climate crisis. We need bold climate legislation, regulation, and investment from the government. And how do we get that? Well, it's political will that will determine how fast we move. We need mobilizations and advocacy and sustained public engagement, and we need everybody. But we especially need those who are most affected by the climate crisis. And yet, because of systemic discrimination, they are the ones that are often overlooked by the philanthropic community. These are young people, indigenous people, people of color and women. They're severely underfunded and they have these shoestring budgets and they're having an outsized impact with it. It's these activists who are fundamentally changing the debate and holding leaders accountable for their action or rather inaction. So philanthropy can play a critical role here in empowering and resourcing these activists and grassroots leadership. In the case of the climate crisis, it's these frontline communities that are most intimately familiar with the crisis. And they're the ones that describe it in the clearest terms and point to the, in the direction of the solutions. Like the environmental defenders who are protecting land in Brazil, or the two indigenous Torres Strait community leaders who are currently taking the Australian government to federal court. And it's the youth climate strikers who at this very moment, while we're all here, are currently occupying the Science Museum in London for its sponsorship from big polluters like Shell and BP. They're exposing the greenwashing and the false solutions and they're making the issue impossible to ignore. We know that social transformation doesn't happen overnight, but philanthropy is uniquely positioned because we can take risks and we can be flexible in our funding to, to support this transformative work. So uh, we know that we have this huge existential threat to the future of our planet. Um, and there's a couple ways that funders who are not traditional, traditionally funding in climate that they can apply a climate lens to their funding. Here's just a few. First, the climate crisis cannot be treated as separate from the other funding areas, as we heard earlier. Climate change is a health issue. It's an educational issue. It's a racial justice issue. It's an economics issue. It's a human rights issue. And neglecting climate risks undermine the success of giving elsewhere. And climate philanthropy has, but it shouldn't exist in a silo. It doesn't look like just one thing. And it doesn't mean turning your back on what you may traditionally be already funding. Every funder can identify how their funding is already contributing to the climate crisis, but also finding the solutions to, for, for the, solutions to the climate crisis already within the areas that they're focusing on. Second is a big one, which is our investments. Um, we can no longer treat the investments of our endowments as separate from our grant making. Uh, often foundations are doing good with their left hand while doing extreme harm with their right. And often that's more capital. Foundations need to invest in a way that builds local, regenerative and democratic economies while ensuring that our investments are providing more value than they are extracting. Our investments just have to align with a just transition to a sustainable and low carbon economy. And third, um, you should join the philanthropy for climate commitment that was mentioned earlier and will be shared in the chat as a signatory. It's a global movement of foundations committed to taking urgent action on climate change, regardless of their mission, size or geography. Um, we're coming together um, all over the globe and signaling our commitment to climate action. And so far there's been 350 foundations or more. It's like always ticking upwards, which is a great sign um, who have joined already. So. Um, like look into it and see if your foundation or your can join it. Um, the, the growing climate emergency presents a serious risk to philanthropic aims everywhere, whatever you're funding. But it also presents an opportunity. When we address the root causes of climate change, we're addressing so many other areas of in, injustice and inequality too. Um, I'm obviously not an expert on climate change and I don't think that you have to be an expert to start funding in climate or using a climate lens on what you're already feel you're an expert in. I'm really grateful that we're here today because there's so much that we need to do to break down the silos in philanthropy so we can think collectively and creatively about how we can be more ambitious in philanthropy and to tackle this crisis. So thank you for joining and I'm looking forward to discussing that with all of you.